rent limits and utility allowances, um, our reporting documents, inspections, and we'll have, like I said, a question and wrap up section. And then very briefly, uh, this is the staff um, on our team. So you guys have met Michelle um, and I'm Molly. And then Stephanie, who's here, she's our consultant, and she's done a lot of great work with us uh, throughout the years. Our executive administrator is Justin Robinson, and then we have a, an additional grants compliance monitor. Her name is Marion Webb. She handles most of the single family uh, compliance. So that's just a very brief introduction as to who we are. And then I'll kick it over to Stephanie to talk about the purpose of the home program. Hi everyone and good afternoon. Um, yeah, so I um, I'm just gonna kind of start today's uh, webinar just to kind of focus our um, our discussion um, in that um, understanding that you know again we're focused on the home program. I would say you know a you know 99% of the 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 rental units that are um, funded by the city um, under you know their their competitive NOFA application comes out of home, um, out, and that is a allocation of funding from um, HUD, Housing and Urban Development, through the Community Planning and Development CPD um, arm of HUD, and it's a formula allocation. That doesn't mean that there's other not other funding sources that some projects um, or properties that you may uh, interact with or work with or own. Um, uh, aren't funded by other sources. We have some that are f funded by CDBG. We have our own local funding source. Um, but just to kind of explain, you know, the vast majority of the properties that are within their compliance period and that we that the team works with is funded under home. And so that's why we focus um, on those regulations um, in this presentation. Um, the home regulations are codified under 24 CFR Part 92, if you ever feel like you need to have some exciting reading for you. But um, generally, the um, so HUD um, uh, provides kind of a framework in which um, they um, want the funds to be utilized. And so they have identified it's a public-private partnership program to um, increase the um, the inventory of affordable housing um, within communities. Um, their target population is very low or low income families. HUD defines very low as 50% AMI and below, and low as 80% AMI and below. Uh, local jurisdictions like um, Louisville Metro will utilize um, other um, their own goals um, to um, within the framework of home. Um, in which to award funding to projects. So you'll see potentially um, that your particular project might have goals where you have um, funding for units that might be 60% AMI and below and set it, and you can't go up to that full 80. And that might be something that um, locally Metro determined um, was in need within the community. And that's part of your commitment to, um, to for ongoing compliance. Um, also, I just wanted to also point out that home in general is kind of considered a um, a gap um, financing program, and what that means is that home is layered with other funding sources and um, to develop pro properties. So a lot of times you'll see home mixed in with tax credits or um, a HUD, you know, 202 loan or something of that nature to, um, to develop these properties. And what that means for you all as owners and managers and, um, uh, you know, compliance managers working with these properties um, during their period of affordability is that now you have all of these layers of funding regulations, home, and how they interact with tax credits or how it interacts with um, housing assistance payments or how it might interact with someone that gets a housing choice voucher. So there's um, in one of the, the 
things that I, I, I always commend um, owners and property managers and those doing the day to day um, is trying to keep all of that together and um, understanding, you know, what is all the subsidy within um, within a unit. Um, it's a very big challenge um, and I, I don't. I, I know that that's a lot, uh, a big job on your guys' shoulders and I commend you for, you know, doing the best that you can. And that's also part of, um, but I want to, I guess, frame it and, and understanding that that's there for a reason because the, the program was set up that way to be that type of gap financing. Um, there's not many projects that are just going to be only funded with home. Um, so, um, so that's just part of how projects get set up on the front end. Um, and so we have all of the fun enjoyment um, of managing it all on the back end. So, um, so again, I commend you all for, you know, doing your best at it. Um, again, the, the ladies on this call um, and the team in general is here to support and help you get through and understand that if you have questions about how those funding sources are mixed and what the rules are and all of that, um, they're great resources. Um, so, again, you know, that's kind of just kind of framing the, the discussion for today. Um, thank you all. And I'm going to be turning it back over to Molly. All right. So, in terms of, like Stephanie said, most of our discussion today is going to focus on the home regulations. Um, we want to focus this particular presentation on the annual compliance review. So the annual compliance review is basically when we look at documents uh, from all, all of you uh, to make sure that your properties are compliant with the home regulations. In terms of uh, when the documents are due, uh, they're due on July 31st, uh, so it's coming up soon. And we actually just made sure our website is up to date. Uh, so it has all the up to date documents on there that you can use uh, when you are doing your reporting. And in terms of the actual reporting period, it's going to be from July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2022. And so I think the 1st thing that's really important for us to talk about is the period of affordability. The easiest way to think about the period of affordability, or as we call it, the POA, is that it is the duration in which a project must be compliant with home regulations. So this means that our office will monitor a project during the entire project's POA. This uh, period of affordability starts when a project is completed and closed in HUD software. And HUD software is called the Integrated Disbursement and Information System, we call it IDIS for short because that's just a lot easier to remember. Um, oh, my lights went off, but that's okay. Um, so during this time, like I said, the project must be compliant with the home regulations and the period of affordability. We typically see a period of affordability um, at about 15 or 20 years. Some projects are shorter and some projects are longer. It really just depends on what is in the legal documents uh, for each project. Okay. And so I mentioned legal documents. Um, we refer to the stipulations of these legal documents as project commitments. These are things that the properties have agreed to uh, when they requested money from Louisville Metro government, specifically home funds in this case. Um, the legal documents, such as the regulatory agreement and other funding agreements, will contain uh, these specific stipulations. Some examples can include the total number of home units, if there is a unit designation, <laughs> if there is a uh, unit mix designation, a certain number of high units or a certain number of low units, um, and then if there are any additional rent or income limits. So, and this is typically where we see most of the errors. And I should say, you know, I've only been in this position for a few months now. And so, in terms of what I have seen so far, I have seen most of the errors occurring when projects are reporting on their specific project commitments. So, one thing that we're trying to do this year is we are trying to be on the forefront of that and trying to be more proactive. So, we are sending out uh, project commitment memos. And basically, uh, these memos will just be a very quick 
um, overview of what is in uh, the funding agreements or the regulatory agreements for each project. It is important to note uh, that there may be additional um, requirements that projects have to abide by. But like I said, this is just a quick overview. And so I have an example here, and I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, um, but very quickly, it contains information about the property, the source of funding that the property receives, uh, the length of a period of affordability and when it ends, and then if the unit is fixed or floating. And this just means that if the unit is consistently designated as a home unit, or if the home designation can change uh, to different units as long as they fit the criteria. And then down here on table one, where it says project specific funded units, we have, and I pulled this from an actual uh, agreement. We have here, for instance, total number of low home units and total number of high home units. And then if there's a breakdown based on uh, bedroom type, and so we can see here that this one has two one bedroom units. This one also has two two bedroom units. And then in terms of high units, there are two one bedroom units and then two or 10 two bedroom units. So we will be sending these uh, letters out uh, by the end of this week. Uh, please use them when you're filling out your compliance documents. Um, the, our goal really is to help you all uh, with your reporting and to uh, just essentially be more efficient with our reporting process. And while Molly um, finishes and goes on to the next slide, I just wanted to chime in about when she talked about, she lists that, you know, this is a funding source from Metro. So generally that's gonna say that that's home um, and then other funds. And she indicated that there was other funds in the project. Um, that is typically gonna be um, because you guys have self reported those other funds in the project as part of previous annual compliance um, reporting. Um, if for some reason that is incorrect or missing a source of funds that has their own rent, you know, and income limits and regulatory limits, generally that is going to be something like um, some type of project based section eight or a HAP contract or a PRAC contract. Um, or low income housing tax credits on our project, and we don't have that, um, please make sure to identify that as part of the documentation that you send in, which Molly will get to. Um, but again, that's coming from self reported information. That's um, not something that that's coming from you all that we're reporting back to you guys. Thank you, Stephanie. Very much appreciate that. Okay, so in terms of uh, rent limits, so again, this is for home units specifically, rent limits refers to the maximum amount uh, that can be charged to an income eligible tenant in a home assisted unit. Um, and these specific amounts are determined by HUD. Our office does not determine them, um, but we use HUD's uh, metrics for when we're reviewing compliance documents. And like Stephanie had said earlier in the presentation, we understand that some properties have additional uh, restrictions uh, for their funding. And so this is just very broadly about what the rent limits are here. And again, we understand that also not, not all projects have all of their units designated as home units. Uh, so again, this is specifically only for the home units. So one of the things that I've noticed in my short tenure of being here is um, there isn't always a consistent reporting of when rents are increasing. So part of our role as a participating jurisdiction or a PJ is that we have to approve um, increases in rents for home units. So we revamped our previous uh, rent approval form. We combined it with our uh, utility allowance form to make just one form. We thought that this would streamline uh, the process a little bit and be easier for you all. So if you are thinking about uh, increasing uh, rents for your home units, we ask that you fill out this form at least 60 days before uh, you intend to increase your rents. Um, you can send it to our office 
please send it to me specifically, or you can send it to Michelle, but ultimately it's going to have to get to me. Uh, once I take a look at your uh, proposed rents, I'm going to determine if they uh, are consistent with the rent limits set by HUD. If they are, then we can go ahead and approve them, and I will send you that approval. It's important to remember that um, you all have to give tenants at least 30 days advance notice, and that's uh, part of the statute. That's not our policy necessarily, so at least want to make you aware of your obligations there. And that forms on our website too. And then in terms of the rent limits, um, yes, that forms available online. In terms of the rent limits, so I know this says 2021. Um, these amounts will most likely be applicable for you all when you are doing your reporting, because as, as I said earlier, the reporting period is from July 1st, 2021 uh, to uh, June 30th, and the new uh, home program rent limits are effective as of uh, June 15th of 2022. So these amounts are most likely going to be applicable to you all. The ones with the stars are the ones that you need to pay attention to. So we have the low home rent limits and then the high home rent limits. Again, this is available on our website as well uh, for your reference. It's also included on our unit compliance report uh, when you're doing your compliance uh, for each individual unit. And then as you can see here, this is the 2022 home program rent limits. Um, they're effective as of about uh, a month ago, almost. Um, as I guess it's no surprise to anyone that HUD increased uh, the rent limits and we all have seen just how crazy the housing market has been, especially the rental market. So this isn't really as much of a surprise, um, but these amounts are applicable to anyone who's been, who's had their income recertified as of June 15th or later. Um, so again, this is on our website uh, for you to review. And when Molly, you know, with the 22, um, in, uh, rent limits, um, you know, we kind of correspond an income verification with when you're doing your lease renewal. So it's anyone that is having a lease renewal that is after um, June 15th, 2022, or a new move in. However, the caveat is that assuming it, if you're increasing your rents, you must have gotten that approval from um, from Molly already. So, um, if you're trying to impose these addition, these increased 2020 or excuse me, 2022 rents um, um, that are now effective, and you haven't gotten in your um, rent approval request yet to Molly, um, you cannot do that until you get those requests um, until you get that request and approval back from her. So, um, so just putting that out there to kind of um, help um, um, make sure you all understand kind of what that process needs to look like. The 2021 rents that she demonstrated or put up there and she's gonna do the same thing with the income limits is really for your reporting um, uh, information. And then the, the next set is for going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that reminder, Stephanie. That's really helpful. Okay, and so here are the income limits for the 2021 home program. Again, these amounts are determined by HUD. Um, it's pretty straightforward um, in terms of what is considered to be extremely low income, um, and it's by household size, and it goes all the way up to 80%. And those amounts will most likely be applicable for uh, your reporting. And then here, effective as of June 15th, are the 2022 home program income limits. It's similar in that it's organized by household size and the area median income. And these will most likely be for, as Stephanie indicated, anyone who's moved in um, June 15th or later, or whose income has been recertified after that date. Are there any questions about the rent limits? 
or the income limits so far? Okay, well, I will move on to the utility allowance. So the easiest way to think about the utility allowance is to think about they are all utilities paid by tenants. Um, this number is important for our office because it helps us figure out if a tenant has been overcharged um, on their rent. So we just looked at rent limits that HUD established. We take those rent limits and we subtract the utility allowance to get the maximum net rent. Most of the time, as a rule of thumb, properties cannot charge more than this maximum net rent. And so I'm going to get into our specific utility allowance policy. So we review utility allowances as part of our unit compliance report, and I'll get into that document in a few minutes. The easiest way to think of the utility allowance is to think of it in two aspects. There, are, there is an exception to these two, but just generally speaking, uh, these are the two utility allowances that we primarily see. So the first one um, is for projects that received home funds prior to August 23rd, 2013. And so this is the LMHA, so it's the Louisville Metro Housing Authority's uh, utility allowance. They publish them. We have those amounts on our website um, that you can view, but they're also included in our unit compliance report. So properties that receive home funds before August 23rd, uh, 2013, typically utilize this particular schedule. Now for projects that received home funds after August 23rd, 2013, uh, usually we'll use the HUD utility schedule model. Um, we understand that there are some projects that get their utility allowances approved from other funding entities like the Kentucky Housing Corporation, and that's fine. We just need documentation about what was approved, um, and it needs to be reported accurately in our unit compliance report. Ali, it looks like there's a question from uh... Deborah, a raise hand from Deborah. Deborah, if you want, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Maybe wait until later. You, you can also, Deborah, feel free to ask the question in the chat and I can uh, verbalize it so that Molly can answer it for everybody in case you're having audio issues. So feel free to, to chat your question if you still have it. I will continue if that's okay. And if, if you yep. get the question, feel free to interrupt me. <laughs> Sounds great. Right. Okay. Um, so in terms of the utility allowance, um, if a project is going to increase its utility allowance, we need that approval. Um, well, we need to make that approval. So similar to the rent increase approval, Fill out that same form with your new utility allowance and uh, submit it to our office. If it's approved by another uh, funding entity, that's fine. Like I said, provide us with that documentation um, so that we have it on file. Is there anything you wanted to add, Stephanie, about utility allowances? No. Okay. And so I'm very briefly going to touch on the uh, HUD utility schedule model. So I saw a question about what reason would there be to increase the utility allowance? Um, Stephanie, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, what reason would there be a change to the utility allowance? It's the question. Um, so just like uh, housing costs, um, utility costs also change, um, whether, um, go increase or decrease. And so that's why it, um, the, uh, the utility allowance, uh, the schedule from LMHA is re, uh, that, um, that can be used by some projects is updated annually, um, to make changes, make sure that the, the utility allowance that's being produced by that particular schedule is appropriate. In addition, um, if you're using the HUD utility schedule model, 
um, which produces a, uh, a specific utility allowance for your property. Again, it's, um, it might produce a, you know, a different utility allowance um, depending upon um, um, depending upon the utility costs that might have changed. So, um, and I know that if you have funding from other funding sources, um, you know, they also have annual approvals. And again, like what Molly said, you know, it's just making sure that you're evaluating that on a year by year basis for your project or projects. If you have multiple that you're doing this for and making sure that that utility allowance is still applicable or might have to, you know, utility costs might have gone up and so that might increase. And when you have a utility allowance that increases, you have actually a lower net rent that you can charge because the tenants paying more in utilities. <clears throat> and there's another question that says, do we have to get permission one time a year when they publish the new unit, unit utility allowance? Um, you can just submit the form uh, throughout the year. It's generally easier if you do it along with the rest of your compliance documents, but you can send that form to me um, at any point throughout the year. If you're doing, if you're using the utility, um, if you're getting the utility allowance that is produced from the Louisville Metro Housing Authority utility schedule, that is built into the unit compliance report. You don't need to get approval to um, to use that or produce uh, or, you know, if there's a utility allowance that changes. Now, if the, you, if you're using that utility allowance from LMHA, who, which is a separate entity from Metro. So just making sure that everyone understands LMHA is not Metro. So we don't know what, you know, they're, they're two different organizations. So we have to get that from them just like you all have to. So, um, if they update their utility schedule, you know, say this coming January, it typically happens. And then all of a sudden, you know, your utility, your utilities, because you're using that model has gone up, then you need to start making changes to your rents um, or, or adjusting accordingly. So um, I know that Molly or whoever, you know, the, the compliance department is, tries to ensure that when those change when that change is made to that schedule and if you're using that schedule um is that it, that's sent out to everyone as you know as they obtain it um as quickly as they can so you all know how that might affect your individual units um and then as molly said if you're using any of these alternative HUD uh, use utility schedule model or um, you've, you're requesting approval for you to using, you know, your the, the utility allowance that's produced from your tax credit, say, um, then, you know, that's really on an annual basis whenever you choose to, but I would say Molly's preference, and I'm speaking for Molly, but <laughs> I would say if I was doing this on a day-to-day -day basis, my preference would be send them in right now in July, so I know, and I can handle it. Um, but you know, we understand that sometimes things might change throughout the year, so um, they can, you can, get, you can send in that approval throughout the year. Yeah, I have the same preference, Stephanie. So thank you for speaking on my behalf. <laughs> um, I really quickly wanted to touch on the HUD utility schedule model. So again, th this is primarily for projects that receive funding commitments after uh, August 23rd, 2013. You can find this form on HUD's website and I have the link uh, right here. You pretty much just go through and put in the applicable information about uh, the specific units that are the home units. It will generate uh, a table and the table is the same table that, that's, that is in our tab three of our unit compliance report. So you just take the information generated from the HUD utility schedule model and you put that into uh, the tab three of the unit compliance report. Um, and there is a uh, handbook online on how to fill out this specific um, form in case anyone needs to uh, review that. 
Okay. So in terms of, I would say the most important part of the presentation, uh, we're gonna go over the required documents for an annual compliance review. I'm going to touch on, uh, at least show you what each Metro provided form looks like. Um, the deadline to submit these documents is July 31st. Uh, so that's in a few weeks. We do request in addition to the Metro provided forms, uh, certain property specific documents. So the 2021 audited financials. Um, if you use a HUD utility schedule model, we would like a copy of that. Your 2022 operating budget. A proof of insurance that lists uh, Louisville Metro government as an additional insured. I've seen several instances where LM and LMG is not listed as an additional insured. So we have to be listed on your insurance, uh, a lease template and a rent roll. So in terms of the Metro provided forms, I'm going to first go over the unit compliance report. So the unit compliance report uh, is an Excel document that our office created. It helps us get an idea of compliance on a unit by unit basis. So when you fill out the unit compliance report, we are only interested in looking at the units that are home units. And Stephanie had mentioned this earlier, and I've mentioned this as well. Um, when you certify, do an income certification uh, for a tenant, that is very important. The date of that is very important because it's going to determine which home rent and which income limits we are looking at for compliance. I suspect that most of you are going to be drawing from the 2021 home rent limits and income limits, but we still need that date because it helps us at least when we're reviewing uh, each unit's compliance. When filling out the uh, unit compliance report, I call it the UCR sometimes because it's just easier to use the acronym. We are looking for uh, residents who have lived in the units as of June 30th of this year. The reporting period is July 1st through 2021 through June 30th, but this is really just a snapshot in terms of what compliance looks like as of June 30th. So I'm going to go through each tab. Oh, did you have something to say, Stephanie? Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, um, sorry, before you get into the tab. So um, one of the things um, why we have that period um, is because, again, under the home regulations, every tenant should have their income um, re verified on an annual basis. There's a different, you know, levels of verification depending upon, um, you know, what year you are. Um, and if you have to get source documentation or not, but everyone should have to um, verify, you know, you as a property owner, you as a pro or property manager um, must verify everyone's income on an annual basis. So you'll see in the UCR, you'll see, you know, a move in date and an unit and an income as a move in. And then you're also going to see, you know, the annual verification and their income as of that date as well. So again, that column is really trying to, is speaking to when did you annually verify um, this tenant's income and, you know, whether that, that could have been, you know, that could be, could have been in October of 2021 and they still live there as of today or June 30th, but you did their verification in 21. So that's why um, we have that long, you know, the, the fiscal year, but we want just want to look at, you know, who's actually living there right now and when they have their income verification completed. Absolutely. So thank you for adding that, Stephanie. So this is a uh, tab 1 of the UCR. It's the instruction tab. I highly recommend reading it before attempting to start uh, filling out the UCR because it will give you an overview of what to expect uh, when filling out the UCR and what information you will need. So if you recall, the project commitment memo that we mentioned earlier will help at least with some of this information. But again, the instructions are very helpful. 
Once you have read the instructions, you're going to either go to tab two or tab three. You can't fill out both, you only fill out one. So tab two is for properties that utilize LMHA's utility schedule. And those are properties that have received, received commitments of home funds prior to August 23rd, 2013. I filled this one out as an example uh, to show you all what we would like to see. Again, this is an example, so this is made up, um, but these amounts are not. So over on the left side, we see the utility or service. So if you can see my cursor, I'm kind of circling around that area. And then if you move a little bit towards the right, there's a monthly dollar allowance, and this is taken from LMHA schedule. And for this specific sheet, it's for apartments. If you have units that are not apartments, but they're home units, please let me know and we can adjust uh, the amounts based on uh, what LMHA has published for its utility schedule, because um, they have them for duplexes and single family homes. So. If you're reporting on units that are not apartments, just please reach out to me. Uh, yes, there are different ones for uh, townhomes. So for you all, the important part is this yellow column right here. So we need to know if a utility is owner paid or tenant paid. And this is important to us because it helps us again, figure out what the utility allowance is, we subtract that from the rent limit, which is determined by HUD to get the uh, net maximum net rent. So for this example here, um, I put that the tenant pays electric. And then moving on down, I put that the tenant pays for the electric that's for cooking and other electric and air conditioning. And this is typically where I've seen most of the errors when filling out this particular tab. Uh, people who fill it out won't put uh, that the tenant pays for other electric and other electric is um, like paying for lights, electricity for lights. And then air conditioning, if your unit has air conditioning, obviously if the tenant pays for that, we would like to know that. And then for this example here, I just put that the tenant pays for electric water heating. Again, fill it out according to how your property divvies out the utilities or who pays for what. But once you select, and there's a little drop down arrow that will appear here that will say owner or tenant. So once you have finished filling this out, amounts will pop up over on this far right side of what the tenants pay for. And then at the very bottom right, there is a summation based on the bedroom size uh, for utilities. We really need this filled out as accurately as possible because this, the amounts that are generated here, auto populate in tab four. So this is for properties uh, that use LMHA's utility schedule. So if you fill out tab two, then you're going to go to tab four. If you do not fill out tab two, you are going to start at tab three, which is the HUD utility schedule model. And similar to what we had talked about um, a couple minutes ago, if you're on HUD's website and you fill out the HUD utility schedule model, it will generate a form just like this. So we will need you to indicate what kind of unit it is up here. And then we need it broken down, the utilities that are paid for by tenants specifically, broken down by how much the tenant pays. So for instance here, I just put in these amounts, they're fake. <laughs> you know, they're not real amounts, but I just did this as an example. So for, for here, I put that the tenant pays for electric. And then for cooking, I put that the tenant pays for that. Other electric, air conditioning, water heating. Um, most of the errors I've seen uh, when filling this out is that people who fill it out will just put one amount, maybe like right here, it might say like 60 and 80. We would prefer that it's broken down so that we can see what tenants are paying for specifically. And also helps us verify that there isn't a utility not being accounted for. Um, and so there will be a summation at the very bottom here. That summation will populate in tab four. 
So Stephanie, is there anything you wanted to add about filling out either of the utility allowance forms? No. Okay. All right, so this is um, probably one of the most important parts. This is tab four of the unit compliance report. I know it looks a little intimidating. I will admit when I first saw this form, I was a little intimidated too. But once you break it down, it's not that bad. And so we have come up with some tips to help you all when filling out this form. If you break it down step by step, it feels a lot more manageable. So like we had said earlier, the purpose of this really is for us to get an idea of what compliance looks like on a unit by unit basis. So for step number one, you know, as Stephanie indicated, a lot of you are reporting to us if you are a light tech property or if you're a project based section eight property. If you are either one of those things, please put your rent information here. Um, that helps us determine that things are being uh, filled out appropriately in terms of the rent limits. So if you don't, if you are not a light tech property and don't receive and are not project based section eight, then you don't have to fill this part out. It's only for properties that are one or both. So then move to step two. That is pretty much self explanatory. Just put in the information about the specific project, the owner, the manager, um, when the report was completed. Here, in terms of um, the second column, I tend to see some errors here. Um, places may not know uh, the total number of high units that they have or low, low home units. And a lot of places may not realize if they're fixed or floating. Sometimes there's some confusion about what is fixed and what is floating. But again, the project commitment memos that we're gonna send out should help um, help you all when filling out this tab four. So once you fill out this information here, uh, there will be a summation on the total number of home units. Oh, the light went out again, that's okay. Please indicate if the utilities are tenant paid or owner paid. And then if there, if you filled out step number one over here, please make sure that you put that there are additional rent restrictions and you can mark, there's a little drop down arrow, you can mark which restrictions are applicable here. And then this is pretty self-explanatory with information about the buildings. So step three um, is filling out information about each unit. So I'm just gonna walk you through what we're requesting. So we just need information about what the unit number is because I double checked this with the rent roll to make sure that it's being reported accurately. The bedroom size that you're reporting on for the, for the home unit, if it's a low or high home unit, and if it's a fixed unit that will probably be in your funding agreements, we'll also put it, um, yeah, it'll be in your funding agreements as to which units are specifically home designated. Uh, please include uh, the tenant's names, because again, like I said, I checked that against the rent roll. Um, household size, move-in date, income at move-in, and then what the reported income was at uh, when they were recertified, when they were recertified, and again, we need uh, these two numbers to help us figure out what is compliant um, up here. If there is an additional rent requirement, so for this example, and this is purely an example that I filled out, um, I just put project based section eight. Once you put in all of that information, a household AMI percentage will pop up here. This subsidy layering max gross rent, um, this will populate based on what the home uh, rent limits are. There's a utility allowance that populates based on whether or not, well, which tab you fill out, tab two or tab three. This number will subtract from this number to get the subsidy layering max net rent. So this is typically uh, the max amount of rent that properties can charge tenants. 
when factoring in the utility allowance. So you may notice a small change. This used to say uh, something about uh, including Section 8 vouchers, if applicable. We understand that there are sometimes additional subsidies uh, that tenants may receive. So we thought it might be more inclusive to say housing assistance instead. So any sort of housing assistance, uh, that is for the unit specifically because we're interested in how much money each unit receives. Please put that here. And then the total rent by tenants, these two numbers will add to make this number, the actual lease rent. And so we compare that with this amount right here to make sure that they are either the same or that this net rent is higher than the actual lease rent. So, and if a property has floating units, please do not report uh, any vacant units. You can float your home assisted unit to a different unit that meets that, that, meets that same criteria. Um, we understand that there are some fixed units that might become vacant. If that's the case, uh, please notify us. If they're vacant at the time you're filling this out, please notify us as soon as they are filled uh, because that could be an issue of non-compliance, but we wanna make sure that none of these home assisted units are vacant. Stephanie, is there anything you wanted to add about filling out the UCR? I just wanted to say, Molly, you are so tricky because you put in um, something that we would catch when we're reviewing these, which is that someone got their recertification not done during the reporting period. Nate Young, who got it done in June of 2021, of June 1st. So that wouldn't be applicable um uh, because they should have had it done june 1st of 2022 um so that would be something that molly would be contacting you all if you <laughs> submitted that because that wouldn't be that wouldn't be allowed so i just wanted to i i as someone with the compliance in mind that i instantly saw that and that wasn't an allowable date um so um i so anyways, so I enjoyed that, um, <laughs> which just shows how nerdy I am. But um, and then um, I guess the only other thing that I wanted to share um, is that I do know that sometimes if you have tax credit, um, uh, tax credit project, and there might be a reason why you might have a variety of different rent limits, um, the the 50% rent or the 60% rent is going to be the standard one for under tax credit. Um, if you put in like a 50% rent limits and you're 50% in that column and then put rent limits in the 60% column, it's going to populate an error and it's going to say only put one um, column in. So please just use one of the columns, 50, 60 or other. If your property has something unique about it that has different levels and that also affects the home units, um, then contact Molly and you know, she can work through with that with you. But again, just, you know, this is reporting on the, the rent limits that are effective with each individual home, home um, assisted unit. Um, so that's where the other rent requirement, when, you know, you check what that is, the spreadsheet is going to look to see, you know, what is actually the rent limit based upon what that subsidy layering is. Um, I also, I saw a, a, a question that came through and was, um, talking about if you have home assist, uh, home funding from a different entity, which would be KHC. Um, yes, you can have that. Um, your KHC home units and your LMG, your Metro home units, those cannot be the same um, units. So you are not allowed to um, mix those two together. So you have to have a different subset of LMG home units and KHC home units. So I just also saw that and wanted to clarify that those two, those are two that cannot mix because it's the same money from two different entities. 
Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> Hi, this is Shawanda. I have a question. Hi, Molly and Stephanie. Hello. Um, so, as you guys know, um, with the um, Section 8 units, which we do have a few here, um, when we do the rent increases and we send them out and we ask you guys if we can increase the rent, the problem is when the renewal, renewal comes up for the Section 8, we may increase at 3% for some of the units because that's typically what you increase. And then, of course, for Section 8, you can only increase at 2%. Are we asking you guys, can we increase at the 2% or is that something that we're, that we just do? So, if my understanding is correct and Stephanie, please feel free to correct me. We're only interested in rents for the home units. Um, Stephanie, do you want to speak more towards percentage increases for the home units? Yeah, so if you have, um. If you have a home unit that is occupied by a section, uh, someone that's using a housing choice voucher or some type of section eight voucher um, that is, you know, paying part of their rent, and um, the Louisville Metro Housing Authority has given, you know, that the, right they do do that two percent increase that you could have. Um, that two percent increase still has to be within the allowable home limits, um, and this again speaks to. You know, LMHA and Louisville Metro government are two separate entities. And so when when LMHA would give you um, that rent in increase um, that's allowed for that Section 8 tenant, that does not mean that they've double checked to make sure that that's allowable under home. Um, so what your job is, is to make sure that when they give you that increase and what's a, what's allowed is that that is still allowable with they're uh, within the home rent limits, which would include the utility allowance um, for that unit. So that can trip people up because, right, like you, you would think that those would coincide, but they don't. Um, so, so my again, I think when I would be looking at this um, and I'm trying to manage it, I would say that you know if you sent in a, a, a an increase, a rent increase request. And you're going to increase everyone that's within a home assisted unit across the board by 3% and that's within the limits. If 1 of those units is only going to and Molly has approved that and only and 1 of those units is only going up 2%. Because they have a section 8 voucher and that's still within the limits and that's still within the approved amount that what Molly has approved. Then you don't need to go back and get approval for those section 8 units. That's um, what I'm. That's it. That's what I yeah. want to thank you. Yeah, you know, I, I, you don't, I don't, I don't see a need to do that. I mean, if, if, if your three percent increase is, you know, up to eight hundred dollars, say, and you know, LMHA is only going to let you go up to seven sixty, then, and Molly says, okay, you could charge eight hundred. That's allowable. Then, if you get only getting seven sixty on a unit because of what LMHA tells you, then that that's still allowable. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. That was a really good question. There's another question or hand raise I see from, I think it's Tara Carmen. Uh, hello, yes, Tara Carmen with the Housing Partnership. Um, in previous years, you guys have uploaded the Excel document for the URC form. And I currently mm -hmm. see that the form that's on the website now is a PDF and it's not an editable PDF. Um, will that change? And then also on this PDF that's on the web, it does not have tab one where you list in your tax credit rents or project base rents. Well, tab one is just the instructions. Um, on the actual URC form. Okay, I will get with um, the person who uploaded those documents to our website just to make sure that they put the Excel version on there. Um, but thank you for letting us know. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, any other questions?
Okay. So the UCR is the first document um, that we talked about. That's a Metro provided document. Uh, the second document is the compliance certification. You may notice it looks a little bit different than it did last year. Um, it's the same information though. So it's requesting the same information as last year. It's just the format's a little bit different. Uh, this form helps us um, evaluate the overall health of the property. And it also includes information about if the pro property is a light check property or if it's a project based section eight. It just helps us double check that what's on the unit compliance report is consistent with what is on here. And the uh, third form that we have is the owner or property manager information. Again, this uh, is the same form as last year, but it looks a little bit different. Um, this helps us know who we can talk to about your specific projects um, as it relates to what kind of, you know, the federal funds that they receive. So this at least helps us, um, like I said, know who we can speak with about your specific projects. Because we understand that there's sometimes some staff turnover, so it's just helpful to have that information. Uh, this next form, this is actually a HUD form. It is the Affirmative Fair Housing Marketing Plan. And according to uh, this specific document, um, it needs to be updated and reviewed about every five years. And it's applicable for properties that have five or more home units. We have this form on our website um, that you can fill out if you need to, if you have five or more home units. And then again, uh, we've talked about this form a couple of times, but if you want to increase your rent or your utility allowance, please fill out this form. It's on our website uh, so that we can review it and make sure that the amounts are consistent with the home uh, regulations or what HUD has indicated is uh, the appropriate rent limits and income limits. Okay. Are there any questions about the required documents for the annual compliance review? Molly, I just wanted to sort of then reiterate the thing that you said earlier, which is there are sort of two, I think of it as sort of two groups of documents that will be submitted. So there's all these forms that Molly just went through these different forms and those are Metro forms that you'll download and fill out. But then secondary to that, we're asking you to submit several forms that come from you. So those are um, your audited financials, your schedule model, your operating budget, proof of insurance, and, and Molly has those listed on the slides. Of course, they're also listed on the website, but just really wanted to clarify there's there's sort of two groups of things that we're requesting. It's these Metro forms that we're asking you to download, fill out, and resubmit. And then there's also uh, your accounting and your information that we're asking from your records as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, I'm going to jump to inspections. So, as a requirement for um, under the home statutes, home units um, have to be inspected. And our inspector, uh, many of you have, may have met him, his name is Jack. He uses standards that are um, under federal law and also chapter 156 of our Louisville Metro government ordinance. So, in terms of how many units are to be inspected, that is determined by the number of uh, home assisted units at a project. So, if it's fewer than four, uh, we need to inspect all of the units. If the number of home assisted units is greater than four, uh, we will inspect about 20% of the units. Typically, when we're uh, figuring out, you know, what units should be inspected, we will also look at, you know, if the units are in different buildings, because that will indicate if a unit needs to be inspected or not. And then in terms of how frequently uh, units should be inspected, um, that is by the total number of units, not just the home assisted units, it's the total number of units in the development. So. If there are 1 to 4 units total, um, our office will do an inspection about every 3 years. 
if it's five to 25 units, uh, there will be an inspection every two years. And if there are 26 or more units uh, in the total development, every year we will need to do an inspection. And just as a note, um, properties within their first year of their period of affordability or their monitoring period uh, will need to have an inspection. So I'm very quickly gonna go over what the inspection process looks like from our end. So our office will typically send an inspection memo um, to a property manager or owner indicating that our office needs to do an inspection for the home units. Um, they will fill out that memo with the home assisted units and return it to our office. We then send that information to our inspector, Jack. He's a housing rehab specialist, and he will uh, contact either the property manager or owner, whoever the contact person is, to set up an inspection. And it's important to remember, and this is by statute, that tenants have to be notified at least 48 hours uh, in advance of an inspection. So once Jack, uh, Jack will do an inspection, and then he typically sends a report like one or two days later. He has a, usually a pretty quick turnaround. If Jack, uh, you know, goes through the property standards and determines that units um, meet the home, uh, you know, home regulations for property standards, and that they also pass uh, Chapter 156 of our Louisville Metro Government Ordinance, he will send a report saying units passed then our office will send a letter, you know, confirming that these units pass their inspections. If Jack determines that uh, there are deficiencies or that the units have failed the inspection in some way, he will send his report. It will say that the unit has failed. The inspection will list specifically what needs to be fixed. Um, he will then uh, reach out to that same contact person and reschedule uh, a reinspection of the units that failed. Um, if he does a reinspection and those units, you know, fix everything that he cited, then we send that letter saying, congratulations, your properties passed the inspection process. Um, if those units fail the reinspection, uh, then the property will be non-compliant with the home regulations. Does anyone have any questions about the inspection or the inspection process? Okay. Well, that brings us uh, to the end. Um, if there is anything that people want to go over specifically, such as how to upload documents to our website, because we didn't cover that today. I'm more than happy to stay on and walk people through that. Or if you have a question about filling out forms, we can uh, certainly do that as well. Our office has been thinking about uh, doing additional trainings. And so we want to hear from you what would be the most beneficial uh, topic for training. And so I have a link here. Uh, for a survey that we created. It is a voluntary survey. No one's going to be penalized for not participating, but we really do want to hear from you uh, so that we can work together uh, to make sure that everyone is compliant uh, with the home regulations. So you're also welcome to email me um, or give me a call if you have additional ideas and you can't fill out the survey. That's totally fine. So. Does anyone have any last minute questions? Looks like we do have a raised hand from Bridget Johnson. Hi, hello everyone. How are you guys doing? Uh, my question is, is this PowerPoint going to be shared or can we get it or no? Yes, it will be. Okay, wonderful. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. This presentation has also been recorded, so we'll share the recording on our website. So you'll have access to the slides, but also to the, the recording of the presentation in the future. Thank you. I saw someone in the chat say something about uploading one document in the UCR. Um, if you have any specific 
um, issues with uploading documents, feel free to email me. Um, you can email me the documents directly, or I can send you a link. Uh, we have a secure file transfer uh, website. I can send you a link to upload documents there. So that's not an issue for me. Just let me know. Yeah, and I, I, I think this particular frustration is the fact that a UCR oh. is designed for apartments and then there's a specific a different um, uh, utility allowance that would be for townhomes. Um, if um, you have that case and anyone else that's on the call that has um, apartments and townhomes that use different utility allowances, um, that are both have home assisted that are both home assisted units. So you have townhomes that are home assisted units and ap apartments that are home assisted units. Contact Molly before you fill it out. Um, the, the UCR, um, we can get essentially two copies of the UCR, one for your townhomes, one for your um, apartments. Um, and we can work on trying to get the, the upload feature to accept an additional UCR. Um, or like Molly said, you can email her directly um, the one that you didn't upload. But, you know, if you come to us in the beginning um, or come to Molly in the beginning, she can easily make that adjustment. So then it's not we're not trying to um, put a square peg in a round hole. Um, I would also comment that we know that there are just, I believe, two projects in our portfolio that have just ju have CDBG funding and have specific uh, regulations that uh, and rules around th that that won't use the home unit compliance report. Molly will be contacting you. You have a separate form that you fill out. Um, again, since it's su such a small um, number in our portfolio at this time. Um, we don't do a training. We don't make it available um, on the website because um, there's just two of you. So, um, so she'll be in contact with you, and we'll work with you uh, at least getting you the forms, and then you can upload them um, just in the same fashion. Does anyone have any other questions, or does anyone want to go over anything? Stephanie, Michelle, is there anything that you wanted to add or you wanted um, our property owners and managers to be aware of? I don't think so. I'd say a, a big thanks in particular to you, Molly, and to Stephanie for being available today and, and sharing this info and getting these presentations together. Um, I'm sure if anyone has been in contact with our office, it's primarily been with Molly and Stephanie, and that, that can continue moving forward. They're definitely the experts and, and can provide the most support as you complete these um, unit compliance reports. I'll say they're due on the 31st. I, I Feel free to get them in ahead of that if you'd like to, but the 31st is the final deadline for those. Um, and then Molly will be reviewing those moving forward and will be in touch with you uh, after that with additional questions or concerns. Um, and similarly, I thank you, Molly. Um, great job. Um, and just for those, um, you know, that have been, you know, working with the department for, um, for a little bit of time, um, you know, we do know that there has been some turnover. So, um, hopefully now you, um, you, you we, the, the department has identified, you know, has identified a need for a compliance manager. And that's Michelle, and I think that that's a, a great move. And um, you know, sh she's got a great team, including Molly, that's um, working with you all. So uh, hopefully, we're um, we understand that you know sometimes it's frustrating when you were communicating with a prior person and then that person leaves. So um, so hopefully, this has helped everyone um, uh, know who who you need to be working with now. Um, I did just want to throw out, um, I know sometimes when you guys submit, I, I do a lot of the review of the financial documents that get submitted. Um, so, um, 2021, uh, your 2021 audits, um, whether you have a fiscal year end of um, June 
or uh, December, um, that's what needs to be submitted. So if it's 12, 31, 2021 year end, then that's the audits that need to be submitted. If it's a June 30, 2021, then um, which again would be almost a year ago. Um, again, that's what needs to be submitted. Um, the 2022 um, operating budgets would be, you know, January through June, um, or excuse me, January through December for if you have that fiscal year end, um, or June um, or July, I guess, of uh, 21 through um, June of 2022. Um, so just wanted to, you know, clarify that. I know that that's been an issue. Um, if for some reason your 2021 audit has not been completed yet, hopefully none of you guys are in that scenario. I know that there sometimes have been delays with that, especially with, um, and you know, COVID and that had delayed some, but hopefully when you're submitting them, you, they're all done because it's either going to be that June 2021 or that December of 2021 and they'll all be done by, by now. But if not, let Molly know um, and when you anticipate receiving it. Um, and then please make sure you send it when you receive it. Um, so don't wait until, you know, Molly, uh, you know, until next year, we, we need that as soon as it's completed. So, so that's my little plug. Um, so we have, all, have all of the, the financial stuff done. So, um, but thank you all. My just final comment will be again to, to plug the survey Molly, uh, put together for us. So. One of our goals as a compliance department in general is to continue to be a, a resource and an improved resource for all of our different partners. And one way that we'd like to do that is by providing additional sort of ongoing trainings and information. We understand that this HUD world can be sort of, you know, opaque and confusing. And so we'd like to be able to provide additional trainings on how all this works and, and be here as a support for you. And so our question to you is, what questions do you have? What, what are parts of of working with Metro that uh, where you'd like additional support or, or like to know how things work a little bit better. And so the best way for us to know that is for you to fill out that survey. And when we see, you know, sort of a resounding feedback that we'd like to know more about this part of the program, we can provide a training on that. So just, just a final plug from Molly's survey there so we can continue to provide support and training moving forward. It was nice to see you all and thank you all for coming. And if you have any questions, please feel free to Give me a call or shoot me an email. I'm happy to uh, work with you all. So thank you all for coming today. Thank you. thank you. I love the structure. Thanks, guys. Thank you.